All right, this morning we are looking at walking with God, holy affections. The text today is Micah 6, 1 through 8. And we announce that usually the text, if we have it, uh, in the highlights. And we really encourage you to go ahead and read that text and meditate on that text because that will prepare your hearts to hear from the Lord. Micah 6, 1 through 8. Hear what the Lord says. Arise, plead your case before the mountains, and let the hills hear your voice. Hear, you mountains, the indictment of the Lord, and you enduring foundations of the earth. For the Lord has an indictment against his people, and he will contend with Israel. O oh, my people, what have I done to you? How have I wearied you? Answer me. For I brought you up from the land of Egypt and redeemed you from the house of slavery. And I sent before you Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. O oh, my people, remember what Balak king of Moab devised and what Balaam the son of Beor answered him. And what happened from Shittim to Gilgal, that you may know the righteous acts of the Lord. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body, for the sin of my soul? He has told you, O oh man or O oh human, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? But to do justice and to love kindness or mercy and to walk humbly with your God. The word of the Lord. Micah is one of those prophets which land in a section of the Hebrew Bible that is called the Book of the Twelve. It's part of the Navim or part of the prophetic section. But Micah is also one of those prophets, you know, when I was in vacation Bible school as a child, we learned the books of the Bible. And in learning the books of the Bible, then we would come to the major prophets and then we would come to the minor prophets. And probably in a child like mine, we thought of the minor prophets as, you know, dwarfs or as midgets, not as big as some of the others. And it's not so much that they are less important. They are, every one of them, even like Obadiah, if he just has one chapter that has come down to us, if there were just a few verses, it is the word of the Lord that comes to these prophets. But maybe you don't know much about Micah, but you really do. Micah had a contemporary that you probably know better, and his name was Isaiah. Isaiah is quite a large, uh, quite a large book. If you sit down in one setting, you're going to be sitting there while reading it. But they prophesied at the same time under the same kings, probably around 740. BC. Micah is from Moresheth. Moresheth is, new, is near Jerusalem, and Micah is prophesying to the southern kingdom, but as someone said, with a side glance to the northern kingdom. 
The northern kingdom, of course, separated after Solomon's death when Rehoboam began with arrogance, arrogancy and pride and the ten northern tribes separated from the house of David. But God had a plan and has a plan and he will carry out that plan through the house of David. And so Micah, his name is in Hebrew, Mecha. It's two words. Mecha is who is like. And of course, it is probably understood that what Micah's mean, uh, his, what, is, what his name means is Mecha, who is like the Lord. And so we read even those words in the seventh chapter of Micah, when in the ending of the book, after all the judgment and the mercy mixed, judgment does not have the last word, but mercy wins out. And Micah says, who is a God like you? Mecha, pardoning iniquity and passing over transgression. For the remnant of his inheritance, he does not retain his anger forever because he delights in steadfast love. He will again have compassion on us. He will tread our iniquities underfoot. You will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea you will show faithfulness to Jacob and steadfast love to Abraham as you have sworn to our fathers from the days of old. The prophets carried the pathos of God. They carried the passion of God for his people. And there is one particular affection or passion that God had and has for his people, which drives this pathos, which drives the passion of God. And so the different prophets in different ways embodied this passion and, and carried this passion. Perhaps Hosea, uh, the most poignant way, because he had to marry one who was in the red light district and she kept running off from him, and yet he redeemed her. He went and bought her out of slavery and was told by God to love her, and finally she settled down and was his faithful wife. That was a picture of the pathos of God, of the passion of God, of this steadfast love. And when you read the book of Micah, what you see that is the meta narrative of all of the book and all of the prophecy of Micah, it is the steadfast love of the Lord. Notice what I read to you that God delights in steadfast love. That's the reason that Micah does not end in judgment, but the steadfast love of the Lord and the faithfulness of God wins out over everything else. The Hebrew word for this steadfast love, and, and it's ubiquitous in the book of Psalms, is chesed. Chesed, remember Jeremiah or whoever the author was in Lamentations when Jerusalem was lying in ruins and it looked like all of God's promises had failed and yet the author reminds himself of the faithfulness of God and he said, your chesedim, your chesed is renewed every morning. Probably one of the greatest interpretations that I ever heard from the translation of Hesed, it is the stubborn kind of, God, of love 
that God has for us that will not let us go. I want you to get a hold of that this morning because that is the kind of love that has captured our hearts. God is not fickle in his love. I was talking to someone in my office this week and I was talking to them about this said love and they looked at me and they said, it's fierce love then, isn't it? And I said, yes. It's fierce love, and we used to sing a song around here about his reckless love. It's a fierce kind of love, and, and, and we cannot even begin to pan the depths. We cannot fathom the depths of this kind of love that God has for us. And someone said, well, I like that message this morning. I came in here kind of feeling guilty, and now I like love because love's going to let me do whatever I want to. After all, God loves me. Yes, he does. And he loves you with a reckless love, and he loves you with an enduring love, and he loves you with a kind of love, the stubborn kind of love, that will not let you go. That's just it. He will not let you go. He loves you so much that he will not leave you where you are. It was Mildred Baines Winecoop in her beautiful classical book on the theology of John Wesley called The Theology of Love in the epilogue. When I got there, I didn't know what she was saying because the epilogue is titled My Controversy with Christ. And the epilogue is all about the fact that the Lord will not leave me alone. He is continually pulling me. He is continually moving me. He is continually convicting me. He is continually challenging me. He is continually encouraging me. He is pleading with me. He is contending with me. It is a controversy. He will not let me. I cannot get comfortable in my Christian life because he's not going to leave me where I was, but he's moving me forward by the power of the Holy Spirit to conform me to the image of the firstborn, and that is Jesus Christ. Now, what we have to understand is what God has brought us into is a covenant relationship. A covenant relationship. This was the problem with Israel. They thought they had a contract with God. Quid pro quo. Just as long as they were bringing the sacrifices, just as long as they were coming to temple, just as long as they were doing what worship looked like to them, then God had to protect them and God had to just wink at their sin and God just would leave them where they were. But that's not what they had. It was not. Covenant relationship is not a contract. But con because contract is something that has stipulations on both sides, but you don't have to have a relationship. But a covenant is a relationship. And in ancient times, there were different kinds of covenants. There were the salt covenants. There were covenants between equals. And then there was what was called a suzerain covenant. And that is the covenant that we have with God both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament today. And the suzerain covenant was, there was a suzerain, a benevolent one, who was very rich and had a lot of land, and he would look on these people, and they were poor, and they were not able to fend for themselves and they had no protection, and the debtors, the creditors rather, were just coming in and taking their land, and the suzerain, out of the goodness of his heart, 
made a covenant of grace with those who were not able to do anything for themselves. They had no protection. They had no provision. And so he took them and he adopted them as his own and he would give them protection and he would give them uh, provision. He would watch over them. He would fight for them. He was the suzerain. He was the greater one. This, uh, these people did nothing to deserve it. They could absolutely not merit this kind of love. They could not merit this kind of covenant. This is the kind of covenant that God makes with his people, both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. And what does he expect in return? It's not that we could ever earn his love. It's not that we could ever do enough to merit this kind of love and this kind of grace. But our response is a responding to this awesome kind of steadfast love and this awesome kind of mercy and of grace when we really get a hold of that kind of love, we were lost, we were without hope, we were without covenant. We are saved today. We are children of God today. We have an inheritance that rust and moth and the thief cannot get to. We are going to spend eternity with the Lord in all of his glory. And the fact of the matter is we were slaves to sin. We were born with a natural bent towards sin. We were born with a bent towards self-sovereignty. The Lord has freed us. And the Lord has set his seal over our lives, the seal of the Holy Spirit. And he is moving us in conformity to Jesus Christ and what else can we do but to love him and to serve him and to bring our bodies as a living sacrifice holy and acceptable unto the Lord the language that Micah uses here is a covenant lawsuit God is suing his people he is suing his people based upon the covenant that is founded in the steadfast love of the Lord. And he calls the mountains and the hills, which are thought of in the people's mind in ancient times as eternal, he calls them as the jury. And he calls the people, he summons the people to come and let the mountains and the hills be the witness of their fickleness and of their disobedience to the covenant. But notice what he says. He says, oh, my people. Oh, my people, what have I done to you? How have I wearied you? Answer me. For I brought you up from the land of Egypt and redeemed you from the house of slavery, and I sent before you Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. Oh, my people, remember what Balak, king of Moab, devised, and what Balaam, the son of Beor, answered him, and what happened from Shittim to Gilgal, that you may know the righteous acts of the Lord. He is showing them the hills and the mountains are the witness that God's steadfast love has endured forever and forever. He delivered them when they were slaves in Egypt. He redeemed them from the house of slavery. He gave them leaders in Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. He kept them in the midst of the wilderness. He provided for them a land. He did not allow Balaam, the prophet, to curse them 
them, but caused him to bless them. And from Shittim to Gilgal means on one side, and the Jordan was parted, and they went dry shot across into the new land. And God says, this is what I have done for you, O my people. Notice, God does not disown us. God does not throw us away. Remember Jeremiah? He went down to the potter's house, and God said, watch the potter, and the potter began to form the clay, and there were flaws in that clay, and so the the, the, the vessel was not able to be centered, and so the potter patiently remade that clay. That's how God found us on the wheel, and there were flaws and weaknesses and still are in us, but with his hands of mercy and with his steadfast love, he doesn't throw us away, but instead he comes to us and he summons us. Listen what he says. He said, I will contend with Israel. I will contend with my people. I don't know about you, but I'm thankful when I fall flat of my face that the Lord doesn't walk away from me but the Lord begins to deal with my heart and the Holy Spirit begins to show me I'm not throwing you away you see there's a shame based uh, uh, religion that sometimes some of us get over into and what it leads to is performance And the shame base acts like this when we're tempted or when we fall flat of our face into sin. We hear this voice and it said, you're good for nothing. You're not worth anything. Why would you go to church? Why would you try again? That's a shame base. And what happens is you try to get up over that sin by doing more and more and more until you're on a performance track and you say, I did this much for the Lord today. I prayed this much and I went to church this many times. That's what Israel answers God with. What shall I come before God with? How shall I bow before God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with thousands of rivers of oil? Hyperbole, shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has told you, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require, demand of you, but to act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. The more and more we do, that shame base just gets worse and worse. You can mark it down. The Holy Spirit doesn't use shame. The Holy Spirit draws you and contends with you with cords of love. And when you hear those voices that talk about you, your identity, that is shame, and that is of your own accord or of the enemy, but he's putting you in the place of nothingness when the Holy Spirit contends with you. He doesn't in generalities because he loves you so much and he will point his finger at that sin he'll point his finger at that temptation and he'll say this is not who you are but you are a child of God you belong to Jesus Christ you have been redeemed by the blood of the lamb you are loved of God and it's that kind of love and it's that kind of grace and it's that kind of in encouragement that causes us to want to get up and to want to say, Lord, I don't know why you love me so much. I don't understand. I can't comprehend this kind of love. But when you pour that love on, everything else falls strangely dim in the light of your glory and in the light of your grace. The Holy Spirit loves us so much, all right, with a fierce kind of love. 
And you see, when it's a contract, Ryan, would you come here, please? When it's a contract, because God has called us to walk with him, God has called us to act justly, to love our neighbor as ourself. He has called us to love mercy. We can't give mercy until we understand the kind of mercy that God gives to us. When we are merciful, when we are showing that kind of mercy, because what else can we do? Because God gave us that kind of mercy. What God wants us to do is to walk with him in victory and in freedom and in holiness and in the love of God. You see, if you've got a contractual idea of salvation, here's what happens. You come and give your lives to Jesus, and uh, he takes you by the hand, and he makes a contract with you, but you better not mess up. Because if you mess up, he's just going to be done with you. That's a contractual. But the fact of the matter is, when you receive Jesus... The Holy Spirit comes into your life. And the Holy Spirit puts a seal on your life. And the Holy Spirit isn't going to run away. He's not afraid of dirt. He's not afraid of failure. He's been doing this a long time. He's had to work with the best and the worst. David said, against you, you only have I sinned and done this sin. He did adultery with Bathsheba, and yet he prays, Lord, create in me a clean heart. Cleanse me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Take not your Holy Spirit from me. And David is in the presence of God today because of the Holy Spirit and because of the mercy of God. And so we begin to walk with the Lord, but all of a sudden something trips us up. And the enemy comes right in and said, you're good for nothing. You may not as well try. But the Holy Spirit said, I'm right here. And you keep walking and you trip up again. You really want to do the will of God. You really want to be what God wants you to be. And you really want to love God like you want to love him, like God is telling you to love him. And I tell you this, brothers and sisters, you can call it what you want, but every one of us, when we start out with Christ, I think there's a honeymoon period when nothing can go wrong and God just pours on his love and his presence and you sense that presence and then all of a sudden the Holy Spirit begins to contend with you because he saved you out of sin unto something and that is freedom and the conformity to Jesus Christ. And so every one of us come to that point where we recognize we cannot live this Christian life in our own strength. And however he gets us there, and whatever you may call it, uh, it is a work of the Holy Spirit. You're not going to get more of the Holy Spirit than you got when you came to Christ in faith. But he's going to get more of you. And so he's not going to fix you to where you don't sin or don't, uh, never sin, but he's going to enable you to where you can get victory more and more. And so when he comes to it, brings you to that point, what happens is we recognize, God, I can't live this life, and I am broken, and I am humble. Walk humbly with your God. That's where it is. And all of a sudden, we recognize how much we need the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit brings us to a different surrender. And when he does that, here's what happens. All of a sudden, we are filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. And he has a hold on us. And he is walking with us. And he is keeping us. And all of a sudden, what we realize is there are affections that are being formed in us. There's a joy in the Lord that we didn't know before. We have a 
contentment in the Lord that we didn't know before. We have a satisfaction in the Lord that we didn't know before. And he's working in that, in that in our hearts, and he's going to work that in our hearts uh, even till the moment that we step into his presence. Uh, and then there's the fear of the Lord. It's not a fear God's going to get you for that. It's an awe of the greatness of his love and the greatness of his presence. Uh, and all of those holy affections get worked in our heart, and it rest our heart and our heart belongs to Jesus and all of a sudden we recognize that there is a strength in us there is a power in us somebody said does he just zap you one time in the first place he doesn't zap you God's more like a crock pot than he is a microwave Amen. It's a process, but that begins a process that will continue. Yeah, it may be a crisis, but there's one, and my mother used to say 40, 11 crises because the Lord has one goal in mind is to shower you with his love and conform you to the image of Jesus Christ. And when the Holy Spirit is in control of your life, and it's a daily surrender, and it is cultivated in prayer, and not, not so he'll love you more. Well, I spent 30 minutes in prayer. I spent 10 minutes in prayer. Maybe he doesn't love me as much. That's shame-based. That's not grace-based. That's shame-based. We have the privilege of being in the presence of God. And the Holy Spirit doesn't work in a vacuum. He works with the Word and with prayer. And when we walk with Him and follow Him and have sweet fellowship with Him, the temptation can come along. But we don't have time for that. Like Nehemiah, I'm working for the Lord. I'm living for the Lord. And I have the strength to say no. And the stronger and stronger we become. Will there ever come a time when there is not the possibility of us falling flat of our face? Absolutely not. We are still in the flesh. But through the Holy Spirit, as we cultivate that relationship it is a progressive work look back over your life you're not where you were you're not where you want to be but thank God you're right where the Lord has you and he continually contends with you and that's the love of God the summons comes not from judgment the summons comes from his love because he knows what he can do with your life and he knows how much joy and how much peace and how much freedom that you can receive in Jesus Christ. Walking with him, it is relationship, it is a covenant, it is not a contract, it is not shame-based, it is based on his grace. And just like the suzerain in the ancient times, he has provided everything Peter said. Listen to me. He has provided everything in the very divine nature that is in you that will give you the privilege of walking in holiness and godliness, walking with the Lord, holy affections. Amen.